By 1820, Kentucky had the sixth largest population of the states in America. Most of this population had European ancestry. A quarter of the population was African American slaves. The antebellum era was a time of affluence for some, steady growth for others, and oppression for many. Each year, historic archaeologists discover new insights into how people lived and died during the antebellum. In the year 2000, archaeologists were conducting extensive surveys of the grounds at Ashland, the Henry Clay estate. Led by Kim McBride, the survey team discovered an unknown feature, an old privy vault. As excavations began, McBride realized they had made a monumental discovery. The old privy vault was completely filled with discarded objects. Over a period of three years, archaeologists carefully excavated fragments from nearly 900 ceramic vessels. The quantity of artifacts from this privy is phenomenal, um, especially in terms of the percentage that we can get back together to refit the different vessels. Most privies have artifacts in them, but this one we felt as we were digging it, sometimes it was almost as much you know, artifacts as dirt. Henry Clay was one of the wealthiest men in Kentucky. After his death in 1852, the original Clay home was demolished. Clay's son built the Italianate house seen today. Sometime during this construction period, ceramics from the original home were thrown down the old privy vault. The privy was then covered and forgotten for over 100 years. Today, McBride's team is analyzing this priceless collection. Each piece is carefully sorted, identified, and refit like a three-dimensional puzzle. The most surprising thing about the privy assemblage has been the variety. We seem to have, you know, vessels of all colors, shapes, um, functions. We've got lots of porcelain. We've got lots of Chinese porcelain, lots of English porcelain, but then also, too, lots of locally made ceramics. It's telling us that the Clay family had very um, lovely set tables, probably, you know, a lot of entertaining um, went on in Ashland, the variety of ceramics, the number of um, well-represented sets of dishes is probably the most varied and likely the most expensive assemblage that I have ever worked on. McBride has also recovered ceramics from the site of Ashland's former slave quarters. By comparing these two collections, she can learn more about daily life on the estate of Henry Clay. This is a, a plate of a sherge from a redware vessel that's from the slave quarters. And our impression is that the slave quarters does have a higher percentage of these coarser wares. Now, is there anywhere in here where it says if it's privy versus slave quarter? We have about 20 matching vessels that are found both in the privy and in slave quarters, which is very interesting. It does show us that there is some sharing of material culture, some probably, we often assume, hand-me-downs of sets that are being discarded from the main house. But um, perhaps they're also, you know, making large purchases and buying for the house and the slave quarters at the same time. Well, it's long, John. Uh, no. During the antebellum period, a quarter of a million enslaved African Americans worked throughout Kentucky. Many slaves worked on farms and plantations. One of the state's largest commercial crops was hemp. This long, tough fiber was used in a variety of products, rope, clothing, and bagging for bales of cotton in the Deep South. The cultivation of hemp 
was hard, dirty work. In Kentucky, slaves did almost all of this back-breaking labor. Archaeologists are gaining insights into the lives of slaves at Farmington Historic Plantation. In 1809, John and Lucy Speed established this farmstead along Beargrass Creek in Jefferson County. By 1840, Farmington was one of the largest hemp plantations in Kentucky. The focus of the research is, first of all, to illuminate what 19th century was like on a hemp plantation. Um, the hemp plantation was successful only because of the large population of enslaved African Americans that worked on the plantation. At, at the height of the operations, at least 57 enslaved African Americans lived and worked at Farmington. Their life is the focus of this work. There are only a few written documents about the slaves who lived at Farmington. One court record lists only their first name, age, and price. In order to fill this void, archaeologists are investigating the remains of buildings preserved on the core grounds. This stone foundation right here was uncovered in uh, 1997 and 1998 by the University of Louisville Field School. And uh, this is a, an outbuilding that was found just on the edge of the main house and the other outbuildings associated with it. Uh, when we did our excavations here, we uh, found a lot of artifacts that uh, we considered to be domestic in nature. And uh, when we looked into the records, we found that the Speed family had written a uh, letter saying that they arrived at the property and they're staying in cabins on the property. So we believe they lived in this cabin while the main house was being constructed. We believe that they converted this building into quarters for their slaves. Today, scholars are working with architects from the University of Cincinnati. The team is using computer graphics to digitally reconstruct Farmington as it looked in 1840. John Speed died that year. The settlement of his estate produced a host of archival documents. Historic plats help define the borders of the original plantation and what buildings existed in 1840. Aerial photos confirm the distance between outbuildings and the main house. Legal records identify the types of crops and livestock, but the exact location of fields and pastures remains speculation. Most of all, artifacts provide clues about the function of each building. Computer animation allows us to take the information we gained from the excavation, the spatial information, and the artifactual information, the glass, the nails, the ceramics, and put them together so that we can actually see or visualize the 19th century. Farmington's slave cabin is also being reconstructed using archaeological research. Field surveys provide dimensions. By today's standards, the cabin was incredibly small, about the size of a modern bedroom. The quantity and type of nails reveal it was a timber structure with clapboard siding and a wood shingle roof. Concentrations of architectural debris mark the location of windows, the door, and what was likely a working porch. Because the cabin is located so close to the core of the plantation, the main house and the main outbuildings, it would probably have been a slave who worked in the main house or had maybe a special skill, a blacksmith, an artisan of some sort, a butcher, someone who had skills that were needed in and around the core of the plantation. Inside, archaeologists know the interior had plaster walls from remnants of lime found in the soil. The cabin most likely had a wood floor and an attic loft. Furnishings would have been plain and spare. A storage cellar was discovered during excavations. Artifacts provide clues about cooking utensils, place settings, and some personal items from the family that once lived here. Coins, buttons, a marble, and fragments 
of a ceramic doll. It would have been a husband and wife, both who worked in the core of the plantation rather than out in the field. And that would have included maybe extended family, children, um, sisters, maybe a grandmother. Between five to 10 people would be living in a cabin about this size. Farmington was at its peak of production when John Speed died. His estate was divided among his wife and children. This included 57 slaves. Some remained on the farm. Most were sold. Their fate is unknown. During the antebellum, an estimated 77,000 slaves from Kentucky were literally sold down the river to plantations in the deep south. Families were ripped apart. Younger generations were separated from family histories, spiritual beliefs, and traditional culture. Archaeologists are trying to reconnect this cultural fabric at over a dozen historic sites in Kentucky. One site is Riverside, a farmstead located southwest of Louisville along the Ohio River. Archaeology has played a key role in the preservation of this early historic site. Nine to 23 slaves worked at Riverside over the course of three owners. Archaeologist Jay Stotman has recovered artifacts from several features that provide a rare glimpse into the traditions of enslaved African Americans. Some of my favorite artifacts are some of the artifacts that we think are related to the slaves that lived here at Riverside. Uh, take, for instance, we have a spoon handle that has an X scratched on it, or some coins with uh, holes pierced in them. Um, these artifacts, or these types of artifacts, have been found in uh, uh, slave context all throughout the South. Slaves carved an X on a variety of objects. The X is thought to be a religious symbol with origins in the Bakongo cosmology of West Africa. Archaeologists also find pierced coins at slave sites. These coins were often worn as amulets or good luck charms to ward off evil spirits. I think these artifacts are very important because they, they give us some insight into um, the lives of enslaved African Americans uh, here at Riverside as well as uh, in, in the South during the antebellum period in general. Um, it gives us insights to their, to their religion, um, some of the conditions that they lived under, or some of the things that they tried to do um, under the oppression of slavery, because that's an aspect of, of uh, slavery life that maybe we can't get with some of the historical documents. This might have been something that, uh, an aspect of their lives that they tried to keep hidden from the people that owned them. Another source of information about life during the antebellum comes from death. In 2002, construction workers uncovered graves at the site of a new government office complex in Frankfurt. There was no official record of the burial ground, which had been obscured by development during the late 1800s. Over a period of three months, archaeologists excavated about 240 burials dating from 1830 to 1850. The site became known as the Old Frankfurt Cemetery. Each burial was carefully documented and exhumed for laboratory analysis by a team of scientists. Physical anthropologists really, we, uh, the main focus is we study human variation and we look at sort of human physiology, human skeletal anatomy, uh, sort of the genetics of that, and say, what's sort of the range? Like, where did people come from? Uh, what was their health? What was their lifestyle? What kind of things were they doing physically? You know, what kind of work were they doing? To explore these questions, Killarn designed a series of laboratory tests. He started with over 300 measurements of each skeleton. These data told him the gender, age, and stature of each individual. 
Killarn analyzed bones and teeth for insights into health, diet, and life ways. We have 238 individuals that we can really clearly identify. Um, 92 of them are children. The average age is about 34, uh, which is sort of typical time period. But we have people living into their 60s. What's surprising about that group is uh, a lot of labor in children. I mean, I'm, I'm getting arthritis in kids that are, you know, in their young ages, uh, really short in stature, which is an indicator of uh, lack of nutrition and sort of bad health. Uh, but, but they're still doing a lot of labor. Um, and I think things probably were really tough for them. Old Frankfurt Cemetery was the burial ground for a working class neighborhood. The slaves, freemen, and laborers who helped build the capital city. From excavations, researchers learned much about the economic status of this population. Through DNA analysis, the team learned surprising facts about their ethnicity. About 30% were Euro-Americans with genetic ties to Central Europe. About 60% were African Americans. Most had genetic markers suggesting West African ancestry. And about 10% had a mixed heritage. It shows that it's an integrated cemetery. Um, it, we have some people with mixed backgrounds, so people are clearly interacting with each other. But what's interesting about that is, is that um, there are African Americans and people of mixed heritage in the upper cemetery and the lower cemetery. So ethnicity and segregation, which you see later in some of the cemeteries in Kentucky, isn't present. There does seem to be some status dividers there, and, but it seems to be more economic. So there's some really interesting things socially going on here. All of the remains from the old Frankfurt site have been reinterred at nearby Fort Hill Park. Killoran continues to compile the scientific data. To better understand the people, he commissioned forensic artist Rebecca Agner to create a series of facial reconstructions. For the first time, Killoran was able to see the faces behind the statistics from this unprecedented investigation. They're just really stunning people. Uh, and it, all the disease, the pathologies, and, and all this other stuff that you know, I know about these individuals, I still look at them and go like, wow, these are, this is somebody that you can see walking down the street today. It's not just measurements or bones or heights or averages. These are real individuals. And that was something that we thought was really important, to make people aware that they were real people, living real lives that were really interesting and worth knowing about. Archaeologists have documented thousands of sites dating to the antebellum period in Kentucky. Each investigation gives scholars a more complete picture of life during this complex era. In Mercer County, archaeologists have gained insights into Shaker ingenuity at Pleasant Hill. Excavations under the wash house have revealed a sophisticated water delivery system. Soil stains found at the dye house have shown the colors used in their textile industry. In Fayette County, excavations at Higby Tavern have provided information about the role of roadside taverns. The discovery of numerous sewing artifacts suggests that clothing repair was part of the tavern's customer service. The antebellum period as a point of establishment in the economies, the agriculture economy, the commercial economies of Kentucky is a rich period. And we're seeing the importance of many different cultures coming together. And certainly we're seeing what many sociologists have called that kind of melting pot phenomena where cultures blend. But we're also seeing the sort of vibrancy and the strength of local cultures persisting amidst you know, that larger blend, especially in our cities, um, such as, say, Louisville, with its, with its large African and German populations, but also in the rural areas, where we have, um, you know, a lot of immigrants coming and clustering in different areas. And by combining the 
Again, the documents with the material culture were getting a better understanding of how these folks came to Kentucky and kind of put together a life using their old cultures but also making a new.